white horse in the Yukon Territory, visiting the Cross River First Nation and ask the people of, of the Yukon Territory. And they like to remind me that for thousands of years, they have referred to this place as Denatuna, which means the People's Trail. And they have known, and their ancestors have known for a long, long time, that this place is connected. It is one large mountain landscape. I'm really proud to partner with them in helping tell the story of this place and those wonderful critters we just saw um, on those slides at the Art Cones Museum. So today, Yellowstone's Yukon Conservation Initiative, working with that same and growing partner is, is committed to protecting the places within this landscape that are not yet protected, connecting those places that have been broken by roads and pipelines and development, and that tends to be in the south of the landscape here in this neighborhood. And we also, just earlier this year, January 1st, launched a new program called Communities of Conservation, focusing on and kind of bundling all of our work in wildlife coexistence, sustainable economic development, smart tourism, and uh, projects like that are available as a connector, a resource, an asset, and a pro bono consulting firm in some cases helping communities solve some of those challenging economic <clears throat> and social problems. So in addition to the Light of Light Vision, which was incorporated as an organization 30 years ago, and the concept of Denatona, articulated by our Casca friends so, so well, there is a wolf who played a very, very important role in the story of our organization. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to be here tonight, because Excuse me, in 1991, June of 1991, uh, a young female wolf was collared near where my partner Kathy and I are living for a year at the Van Moore headquarters of Yellowstone Yukon in Peter Lougheed Provincial Park. And this wolf was captured with uh, early radio and GPS collar technology in 91. And over the next, this is a, a reenactment of what she did, over the next nine months, this one wolf made a big lap through two provinces, three states, and covered an area. If you filled in that circle she walked, that is 10 times larger than Yellowstone National Park. So the wolves have known for a long time that this is one place, and keeping it connected is a really important project. So this uh, wolf, Pluie was her name, which is French for rain, because the day she was called, it was a very rainy, wet, miserable day, and she was named for that. Fast forward four years later, in December of 1995, Pluie was shot and killed in an illegal hunt south of Kootenai National Park, here where the tracks end. And so for our organization, this her, her travels occurred in a year or two prior to our organization's founding. Uh, she was a world famous wolf when it, uh, when it was all said and done because she was one of the first animals trapped with this kind of technology and whose story was told in the media worldwide. And so she's a very important part of our, our family, one of our ancestors, if you will. If you're a person who's curious about this, would like to see how uh, what one of these collars looked like 30 years ago, I did bring tonight. Louis Holler here, bullet holes and all, um, really a, a powerful part of our history. So to be able to share that connection with George tonight is something that's really meaningful to me and to us as an organization. And when you visit our office, this collar is in a prominent place in the reception area and reminds us of what we're uh, what we're up to here. I would like to say a little bit more about the organization. This is this is the map. Um, you know where to find yourselves. As I said, the Southern Anchor is such an important place in this much larger landscape, which runs 2,100 miles north to south, and uh, is twice the size, if you measure the entire area, twice the size of Texas, twice the land area of Texas, twice the land area of Alberta. And we lean heavily into the science. That's another thing I appreciate about George and his work is he knows his Ecology, has a couple of degrees uh, related to the field, and really does, uh, I think, as well as anyone, connects the science to the art for the reason we're all here tonight. So, a few things about the accomplishments I mentioned again. Again, over the last 30 years, we've seen almost a doubling of protected land 
lands in this landscape, again, by line and our partners, mainly our partners, could increase at 80%. We've also seen, you guys have some great ones here in Wyoming as well, that crossing structures, overpasses and underpasses. 30 years ago, there were none in this landscape that were purpose-built for wildlife migrations, and today, this number's even allocated, more than 120 exist today in this landscape, thanks to the support of some people who are in this room tonight, in fact, and more are being built. So we're really happy to see the uh, momentum that has built over the years, the growing commitment that people have made to this on both sides of the international border and lots of political jurisdictions within those. And today, you know, believe it or not, there, despite all the, the bad news that's out there when it comes to conservation and wildlife protection, there's some really good things happening in Canada and the US. In Canada at the national level, and at the Northwest Territories, Yukon and British Columbia level have all committed to protecting 30% of their land and waters by 2030. Canada has committed to creating 10 new national parks between now and 2030. And a lot of it is going to happen in the Yellowstone to Yukon landscape. Now, on the U.S. side, I don't think it's likely, in my lifetime, that we're going to see any Yellowstone parks and Teton National Park designated. But just a week ago, the U.S. government launched a $350 million program, new national program, committed to building new wildlife overpasses and underpasses. And there's a call for proposals out right now. Any community, any tribe, or any nonprofit organization who wants to help get these built and participate in a competitive national process can do that. And one of the things YOI is doing is helping folks who want to put those proposals together, write them, submit them, advocate for them, that's one of the services that we offer, in addition to some of the exciting coexistence work I mentioned. This is a very recent, very real life example from Montana. This is I-90, the right line running east to west. This is about 45 minutes east of Missoula. All the yellow squiggles on the map were made by another animal wearing one of these collars. This was a grizzly bear, a biologist named Tim Lehman filter. And this is a map of this bear uh, from November of 2020 to December of 2020, a 30-day period. And then again, um, from April to May of the following year, two months, in two months, a month, right before hibernation and right after hibernation, this bear tried to cross I-90 more than 40 times. And eventually it did. Here in the upper left, you can see where, oh, finally it found it, uh, an underpass, a bridge, a highway bridge over a creek, and it snuck through and made the way. So we know where these things need to get built. This is one of the places we know in two ways. One is by collar data like this, and the other is because of the fact that forever, ever since county and state road crews have had to come out and clean up car accidents and pick up roadkill, they don't want those locations. So if you take this map, and you overlay it with a map of vehicle wildlife collisions, you know where the animals need these crossings to be built and where people need them to be built for public safety. So this is a brand new opportunity nationally and here in the region to get a lot of these things built, and they were. Actually, this is a Wyoming. Yes, the Wyoming Migration Initiative, if anybody wants that great that interview. Um, this reduces collisions by anywhere between 80 and 96% depending on circumstances. So there's a lot of good happening out there. And one piece is big protected areas pushed in the north, the other is the unprecedented amount of funding for wildlife crossing structures here in the south. And you are the people who can help make this happen. So it's really, really a, a wonderful time to be doing this work. And Part of this work is inspiring people through art and storytelling and experiences in the field with these animals in these places. And our guest this evening, the star of the show, George Fielding, embodies a lot of that, uh, of that work. Being scientifically trained, being a highly skilled artist, one of the best guides ever to lead people through these systems here in the Greater Yellowstone amazing storyteller and a wonderful person to spend time with. A little bit about uh, George, and then I'll turn things over to him. Um, he has lived and worked much of his life in, in near Gardner, the north entrance of Yellowstone National Park, with his wife and their kid, who's in the right here. Okay. So George is, is missing family this evening. So we'll get him home, we'll get him home 
seeing here. Um, George has a bachelor's and a master's degree in wildlife ecology. He has worked as a researcher, a taxidermist, a backcountry guy, an environmental consultant, and he teaches art and natural history programs as well for all age groups. He has, uh, his work is, is a part of permanent collections at quite a few museums around the West and around the world, including this one. Also the Brent Museum in Big Horn, Wyoming, the Booth Museum of Western Art in Kernersville, Georgia, and one of my favorites, the C.M. Russell Museum in Great Falls, Montana. And his work has been featured all over the place in the media, from TED Talks to the Washington Post to the Sacramento Bee, the LA Times, Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation. It's a really big deal if he's here with us tonight. <laughs> and two other things about George before I make him quick blush in here. Um, he has a book coming out about animal language, and you're going to get a little bit of insight here for those here for the first day yesterday. There may or may not be some animal language coming out of the show here. Um, but next fall, fall 2024, there's a new book coming out. If you didn't get a chance to meet George or stop by our table out from the White Line table of big banners at the right side of that has some brochures and business cards and contact information for uh, George. And with that, thank you for being here. And please give a warm welcome to George Buman.
And on one of those days, I happened to be out with some folks. And we were standing at the confluence of the Lamar River and Sodiu Creek. Which there are so, so few places in North America you can stand in the spring, for sure, as it comes here pretty soon, and watch a wild river flood and not see a single piece of trash. That's a pretty profound thing. But as we were standing at that spot, it was a little bit after the main flood, but the water was still high. And we're just up there on the hill above the road because it's a beautiful spot, listening to all those sounds and more. One of the younger members of our group said, there's a wolf over there. Where, 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 where? Quietly, over there. And along the same embankment of bluff dropping down the river was the wolf. We had missed it. <laughs> the adults, right? The kids are often far more astute than, than we are sometimes. And she was right. So it wasn't just any wolf. It was Wolf 42. The alpha female of the Druid Heat Pack. The Cinderella wolf shown on National Geographic films. And as it would turn out, this was the very last time she would ever bring puppies across the Lamar River. And so do you Creek for the past traditional rendezvous site. And we were there for it. This happened on one day of the year. And so they have enabled them where they have the young, and they rear them until they're mobile and able to feed to a certain degree. And then they take them to the rendezvous site, which is an elaborate, basically, baby safe spot. <laughs> the adults go to, to hunt, and they bring food back, and the kids stay there. In theory, not always, but they have to get them there. And this was moving day. So as we watched 42, she came to the edge of the bluff and she looked, surveying the scene. And then she did one of these. A lot of communication in wolves and a lot of the meaning is conveyed not through their voices, although a lot is through their gestures and the way they move. And anyone who's a hunter or a close observer of nature knows that when animals stop and they look behind them, there's a good chance there's somebody following, right? <laughs> and there was. There were five tiny little puppies about this tall who trundled out of the trees behind her. And they gathered at their side as if to say, now what, Mom? <laughs> and you can see all those good spots got these wide eyes. They were looking at all of this river and roads and people and all these things that they had never encountered before. And so as they stood there, Mom surveyed the scene and down she went. She went down the embankment of the block, across the road with the pups then right in behind her. And it was hysterical because so when the puppies got to the road, it was, it was the first week of July, and the road at that point in the morning was warm. The sun had warmed it, and then these little puppies are kicking their paws up. They're going to the hot bed, smashing out as they're walking across. They follow, they have to cross the road. So they got through the first big barrier. Then they came to the second. So did you creep, although it was not at highest, the highest flood stage, was high water. Mom and two of her adult daughters, Auntie One and Auntie Two, we'll call them, came in behind. And the three adults crossed the creek and then looked back for the puppies. And they minced around back and forth a little bit, but finally they just dove in. And all four of four of the five got across, but the water took them down dead. The fifth one got walked way downstream, about 100 yards. And you can see the other puppies wondering where it was, and the adults were looking for it. And pretty soon you see it pop up out of the water and it shake off in that morning light. It's just this prismatic flare of water droplets that that top shook off after it finally got through. And they all rejoined, and they followed along beautifully, soaking wet to the big cross. The big obstacle was the Lamont River. Mom assembled them at the, the crossing spot. Hey, kid, you got this. This is the spot. You ready? We're going to cross from right here to over there. So she gathered them all up 
and Palm T1 and Palm T2 all cross the river. They get to the other side and they look back. And the kids said, the hell with that. <laughs> and they took off up the up river on the same day that they were on. So mom goes back and is hysterical. She starts rounding them up, walking around. As she did that, it was one of the most touching things I'd ever seen. She picked up, by the end of the episode, seven different objects in her mouth. Sometimes it was literally a rock. Other times it was sticks. And she used these like a lure. As if to say, I'm looking for you. You want it? Well, you got to come with me. And she brought them all back to the crossing spot again. She and the other adults crossed. They looked back. And off they go again. Ah! Kids, right? But as patient as she was, she went back each time and every time. And every time they inched further up along the river to the point where they made it around the bend and you couldn't see them. I don't know. Did they make it? We sat there for over an hour, hour and a half, two hours, who knows? Maybe it was half an hour. It seemed like it was really long. And finally, out of the sagebrush came a wolf's back, a second wolf's back. These were adults. And we could see them moving until they got to an open spot, and then behind and hidden by the sage up to that point were all five little ones. <laughs> now, we experience things like that, and you don't forget them easily. As a friend of mine said, if, if, first off, if you think I'm carrying a liver or a heart, I'm <laughs> not part of the organ donor program. Um, this is how I keep my clay warm. <laughs> And um, when I go in the park, and you want to sculpt, you have to sculpt efficiently. And if your clay gets too cold, it's hard to move because it's just rock hard. But the story, the elements of story are so powerful. And as a friend of this friend, Jeff, Jeff said, he said, you can see the most amazing footage ever taken. The first time this experience was filmed on camera. And it's there on the nature channel, right? And you forget it in 20 minutes. But you see something even mildly neat. A hawk flies by your, your head as you step out the door of the house. You don't forget those things. Will this get me out? When you have that personal experience, it sticks with you. You can't help but want to tell someone about it, right? And that's the way I feel. I'm very privileged to have the time that I do in the park and accumulate these amazing stories to tell about these lands and the inhabitants of them. And so how do you take a piece of wire and some stuff dug out of the earth and tell that story? Well, it takes some practice and persistence. And you're going to help me a little bit here. Because in order to get this right, and to be fair, it's never right. Art is never done. It's only abandoned. <laughs> and why is that? It's because it being a story of a type of expression is that you feel different about it every time, right? You don't tell the same story the same way to a different audience. You don't tell it the same way this year as you will tell it next year. You don't tell it the same way to your kids. And so the story is a living thing. It's a plastic thing. It evolves. It needs to grow, and it needs to be passed on. But it operates on a few fundamental elements that we can't escape from. If you're telling that story with music, there are things like harmony and harmonics. There are compositional elements, rise and fall, crescendos. If you're telling it in film, that medium has a different 
set of rules. And each one of them has its own. Sometimes I lose words <laughs> as I dive in here. But each one of them has its own assets and qualities that help tell slices of the story in different ways. Some stories are best told orally. Some are best told verbally. Um, sorry, see, I'm losing words. They're best told through maybe performance and gesture. Maybe they're best told through writing. But however that story is told, there are elements of that medium that we are bounded by that limit us, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in frustrating ways. And as I tell the story of Wolf 42, and I often do this in the studio, I borrow from those other media to help me realize my story in clay. So for instance, if you had to pick one word to describe what Wolf 42's story of those puppies meant, what would you pick? You can say it to yourself or you can throw it out. And what I mean by a word, I mean eternal things, big things, things that are not bound by species or place, or time. Things like love, things like envy, jealousy, joy. So what would you pick? Mothering. Say love again. Mothering. Mothering. Courage. Yeah. Courage. Why'd you pick courage? Because that family did. Those puppies had to have some courage. Yeah, those puppies had to have courage and trust and their mother, and those aunts. Family. Family. Yeah. Understanding. Others? Understanding. Understanding. Why, why do you say that one? Well, like, you know, the mother's going to be saying that her son <coughs> has a problem. And that means she has a family over there. Yeah. Same spot. Same family. Yeah. Yeah. What did she say? <laughs> <laughs> So I will literally take these words and write them down on a piece of paper and put them on the fourth floor in the studio. Yeah. And I, for days and weeks, and a lot of sculptures I actually try to hold on to for years. Some I've held on for three, four, five, eight years, trying to get those words, which are in themselves pretty limiting, but they're an attempt at finding meaning that captures what it is that I experienced. And so, as I waffle here for the most basics of the world, they look awful. Which most art is, the process of art is failure. This is a really important thing to convey to children, is that failure is not a negative thing. Failure is a selection process divination attempt to find what it is in a material, an experience, an interaction that moves you. There are times I come home and grab a piece of wax after seeing something like the last of the druid wolves, the females had mange, and they were so weakened by their condition that a set of new males, normally really hot guys, <laughs> that they want to get to know. And they were so weakened that they couldn't even stand. But they couldn't lay down in the snow either because their tattered coats were so thin that unless they found a tree well or some area of bare ground, it was too cold for them to lie down to them. And I came home from that just, there weren't words for it. But what I did think of was an image I thought of James Earl Frazier's End of the Trail. You know that sculpture? The Indian on horseback with the downward facing lamp and the downward facing head. 
head of the chorus down, sort of across to the wind. So I did my own version of that. And uh, that's piece for where the words taper off. So can you tell a story in use a wolf versus a coyote or a fox? There are principles that tell you this is a wolf versus one of those other species. And one of those is that for most quadrupeds in North America, the height of the back is equivalent almost exactly to the length of the body trunk from the rump to the shoulder or the front of the sternum. So from there to there. So I got it right? Yeah, it's close. And close enough. Close enough. <laughs> the length of the neck. And a lot of our, the, the expressive elements are in the proportion. Gesture for sure, light, angle, movement, but proportion. Rodin's Burgers of Calais, um, other works, uh, Michelangelo's um, David, the exaggeration of the hands in other works, heads, those help guide us through a piece. So if you're going to use proportion effectively, you have to know what the rules are in order to break them correctly and efficiently in a way that lets you get your message across. So one of them is that the neck is one and a quarter the length of the skull. The length of the skull is also a third of the length of the body. So let me just measure here. The nose, remember, is not bone. You have to measure the bone. And I'm one of the few kids in town, well, the only kid in town, who threw out all of his fishing tackle and into that tackle box put calipers, measuring <laughs> tapes, dissecting knives, rubber gloves, pens, pencils, and my own data sheet. So the, the day we drove over the pass from Driggs, <laughs> <laughs> and found a loaded dead cow moose on the highway, I could jump out of the car, make a whole set of measurements for my wife, who was a saint, waited for me in the vehicle, and now I had that data sheet, which I have a file folder full of everything from mountain lions and loaded moose to bears and wolves and coyotes, jackrabbits, um, or Walter, who did the elk entryway. He called me up one day because he was doing the piece for the airport. He says, George, I need the measurements of a dead jackrabbit. You're the only <laughs> one I can think of who would have them. I said, sure as hell, I got a white belt jackrabbit set right here. And <laughs> so here's the length of the, the skull one and a quarter, and one, two, three. That's close, but something's wrong. Doesn't look right. And that's always how it comes to Bob Dayton, my hero, who did the cheat, the painting of the big buffalo in the permanent collection here. The first nature observations I ever recorded were an account with Robert Dayton illustrated subject artwork. And I got to meet Bob and hear it and visit him up at their place. And that I had his books, but that was the only thing I wanted him to sign was my copy of the calendar with a Canada geese on the front for my first nature observations written in them. And Bob's always has been one that says, if nature and science are in conflict, art always wins. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> Even though my background is science, I'm like, yeah, I want to be able to have a prerogative to change this here. So to know how to express something outwardly, you'll also have to know your subject inwardly. So you have to know simple things like, where's the knee? Where's the elbow? Is this, let's see, is the knee here? Because it's all the same anatomy, it's just proportionally changed. Is this the knee? Is this the knee down here? Yes. Yes? Here's some yeses, no's. Ooh, dissension in the ranks. 
The knee and the elbow on most quadrupeds is located directly in line with the bottom of the belly. The knee resides here, the elbow resides there. It's functionally efficient when they're going through deep snow and mud and water. Okay. The joint that faces the other direction that you hear sometimes folks interpreting to their families in the park, kind of armchair uh, interpretation. That joint on the belt that faces the other way, that's the knee. Their knees face different, and you probably heard the one about moose too. They have different joints than other animals. It allows them to because the crap water goes out. Nobody tells me. And the same stinking joints we do, there's slight modifications to it, but there's nothing miraculous. Okay? There is something miraculous, but I digress. So knowing what's inside helps us communicate with the stuff on the outside. So, for instance, this is a wolf. Wolf 42 is a part of that story. And knowing where the ears actually are and how big they are relative to the head is critical when you're identifying a wolf versus a coyote in the field. Right? You ever have that trouble? It's a wolf. And certainly with the international visitor, a friend, these folks from Japan have the most beautiful photos of a coyote in Yellowstone. <laughs> And they were so excited, and they showed him this photo, and this is the kind of number that all educators run to at some point. If you haven't, you just have to do it enough because it happened. Look, look, he said, look, wolf here. Yeah. Look, picture of wolf. Why do you have a wolf? Oh, and he was like, oh, no. Do I tell him? Tell him. I tell him. That instance he pulled up. He deleted all of them. <laughs> So we have to know this is a coyote with those big ears relative to the size of the head and that smaller muzzle, pointier nose and muzzle. Okay, you see that on the screen? Or is this a Labrador retriever? <laughs> it don't matter, right? It's a wolf. A wolf is at the heart of the story, the symbolism, the mystique, the drama that inherently is baked into Canis Lupus. Runs through and through that animal. So the more you know about that animal, the more you read into it. And the more you read into it, the more you should expect to see the artist's liberties working with what nature provides. So I'm making it a wolf again. That heavy lower jaw adapted not for hunting a small mammal like the coyote, but for large hoof prey. Okay. So I'll stop there for a moment and just ask you this simple question. Is this art? Thank you. I appreciate that, but I would say no. this is data. This is the product of measurements and observations in the field. It's a product of proportion and knowing how far the tail goes down on a wolf, how long is the tail? It goes almost to the heel joint, the hock joint. So the knee is here. This is equivalent to the heel, the calcaneus. Okay. So the tail goes almost to the to the top of the calcaneus. But this is a blank slate. It doesn't have a story to me. It's very easy and quick to put together a convincing wolf, but it doesn't tell the story. And what's the story? It's the story of courage and parenthood, dedication, family. That's where the story is. And that's where the art lives. So, I'm going to change it.
whatever you're doing, don't, don't work your wall. <laughs> oh. Does this say courage, Mark? Yes. 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 What about there? Mm -hmm. I did that. Alarm. Intrigue. What if I did this? Sit down at the bench and play. And 
the young man stepped down to play and he finished and he turned around to get Brown's reaction and he was sitting in the corner in his chair and he didn't say a word and that silence went on for a little while <laughs> an uncomfortable while and when he did speak what he said sort of cut right to his bones and what he said was you satisfy yourself quite easily. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> but it was the truth. And I think as we all engage in our own art, and your art, it may be in mathematics. Your art may be in bringing people together. Your art may be in fiber textiles. It may be in performance. Your art may be in any number of things. It's the things, in my opinion, art is a broad concept. It's the things that keep you up at night for the best of reasons. Or the ones that you do, and someone asks, why are you doing that? That you say what a kid says. Because <laughs> I want to. It inspires me. It's fun. I don't need to describe it to you. I just want to do it. And herein lies your art. And so when you use your art to experience your world, I help, it, this helps me see deeper into what I experience. I know to look at the flank of that wolf in order to express this better. When you see them in the light of sunset, or the way the forms of the face and the light goes over the roots of the carnaxial teeth and down to the zygomatic arch of the skull and all these things that I have to pay attention to better because there's way more in nature than we ever see, certainly, in the first show or 20 or 500. <laughs> so if there is one thing I can convey to you is do your art, whatever your art is, use it to tell your stories and tell your stories well by your measure and do them the very best you can. You all are very fortunate to live here or be visiting here, and you will have stories about this place. And if there is a time in history where we need to tell effective, artful stories for the betterment of all of us, but all the other living beings that we share this planet with, it's now. We have to tell stories that tell us what is important. So, the work of this museum, if you have not been to the Hall of the Canine exhibit, wonderful, wonderful exhibit. Ronan Donovan's photography, some of the precious wolf photography and imagery I've seen in a long time. And there's a lot of wolf photos out there. <laughs> <laughs> and the work of the Wide and Wide Coast in saving the landscape so that the generations of the future can continue to tell the stories and have the experiences that you are telling them about. It's essential. It's essential for us, our souls, it's essential for the landscape and everything we share it with. So thank you so much for having me. before you ask your question. Also, indicate who your question is for, either for George or for Scott. And Scott can come up here and well, I have to mind how you can do that. <laughs> Maybe you and George can pass the final here. Would that work? I better read this mic here for Scott. Oh, George, you are under your time. I was just under my time. Next time, I'll show you. <laughs> So yeah, raise your hand if you have a question for either Scott or George, and we will bring you the mic. What is, what, okay, how are dogs related to wolves? Oh, so 
dogs up until recently, is this working right now? Yeah. As of recently, <laughs> just yell. Um, dogs genetically were indistinguishable from wolves. They've developed the technology now to have the, the, um, the low side to look at to differentiate a dog from a wolf. Um, but they are very closely related. Dogs came from wolves, so in some taxonomists' minds, Canis lupus, or Canis familiaris, rather, the domestic dog in all its iterations, from the Chihuahua to the, the Mastiff, they're all wolves that have been greatly altered through selective breeding. How but, interesting. But they're at their origin, they're wolves. So some will say they, they actually belong to Canis lupus familiaris, wow. rather than their own species. They can interbreed, which is, a lot of you remember from basic biology, that's one of the tenets of a species. You know, they can breed with this one and that one and produce a viable offspring capable of breeding itself. So, um, they are wolves. How interesting, thank you. What's that? I said, how interesting, thank Yeah, you. yeah, it really is. And it, just to, to add to that, the black coloration in some of those wolves, that you see in Rowan's photography, that gene at the K locus that dictates black coloration in wolf coats is thought to have been reintroduced to the wolf population from domestic dogs tens of thousands of years ago. Interestingly, it's also tied to the immune system. So what they've seen in the field play out is that black wolves have stronger immune systems, but they have fewer pups. Gray colored gray wolves have more pups, but have lower immune systems. And when you average it out across black versus gray, their fitness is the same, in meaning how many viable you know, young they have that go on to reproduce. It's the same, it's just two different strategies, which happens to be linked to coat color as well. So interesting. How old were you when you realized how old was I when I realized it was an artist? Well, every child is an artist until some knucklehead tells them that that doesn't look like a tree. <laughs> right, they'll ask some people ask about my son. They're like, is he showing problems in the studio? Yeah, he's a kid. He's creative. You look to, to land-based cultures, creativity runs through everything. You don't just make a bag. You make it the best damn bag that anyone's ever seen. You honor the gods, you honor your relatives, you honor the ancestors in what you make with and on that bag. It's our culture that has segregated creativity into these ridiculous baskets that, that don't make any sense. Everyone's creative, but I grew up around an artist. My mom's a sculptor, and to be fair, I tried like hell never to do that. <laughs> I went all the way through my other passion not art, it was in ecology, natural history, and went all the way through a master's, only to get to the other end and realize, I'm not sure this is it either. <laughs> so, anyone who, I, I know there's a couple in this crowd who have told somebody that journey, and I found it through bringing them together. What is my most difficult sculpture ever made? You know, one of my mentors, Floyd DeWitt, uh, who's now passed, um, referred to the monument. And the monument has nothing to do with size. The monument has everything to do with the power of its conveyance, its energy, its meaning. And so it's easy to say that the hardest sculpture ever was the 13 foot tall deer that I had to weld the frame up to, but when I tried to fit it in the neighbor's garage, who let me do it in there, it was too tall, they had to cut it apart and saw the whole thing apart and weld in these nifty sleeves so I could pull the head and the rear end off and slide it into the garage and get it out of the frame and put it back together when I wheeled it back out and stuff like that. But the hardest ones are really the ones that I'm not sure about what they're telling me. I, I have this experience, like I watched this one wolf, and she's depicted on the card on the table out there, the white wolf. And 
I was driving up to Lamar Valley, it was my intention that day in the northern part of Yellowstone, but I never made it, I saw a mountain goat. I'm like, oh, well, that's really low for a mountain goat. It wasn't a goat, it was her. The one white female in the entire park population. It was a canyon female, gorgeous, and it got shot. I was the last one to see her alive from the deck of our house looking across through the spotting scope as I took dinner in the park. And for the next day she was gone. So you develop a relationship with a lot of these non-human individuals. And, the, and you know their patterns. She's gonna go right behind that wolf and pee on that sagebrush. <laughs> and when she does, you're like, see, I told you. <laughs> And she, in her packet, made a kill up near Mammoth a couple, like about a year or two before she died. And I said to my friend who's a photographer, and she said, they're gonna come across the road, but they're gonna go through that draw right there. And if you want a photo, get on that hill and get ready for the shot. And they did exactly that, and they went down. But at one point, after she came across the road and through the draw, she came up on a hill and stopped. And she just looked into the distance. And in that moment, as a human being, I knew that if she went over the next mountain, she could get shot and killed, because that was the park order. I knew that another enemy pack was just around the other side of that mountain, and if she went that way, they would kill her family. If she went that way, she'd be in town and mammoth around all the people, and she'd probably get hazed out. If she went back the way she came into the interior of the park, there'd be no food. So to me, this momentary pause of this elder wolf leading her pack, the gravity of that and so much more made that really difficult for me to disentangle. So I made, came home and I made a little wax study about this big. And I kept it in my cupboard with all the other studies. And the ones that don't cut the mustard get thrown out and melted. And I kept putting her back in, putting her back in, putting her back in. And after about two years, I said, I need to do, I need to do a, a real piece of this. And I built it out about this big. And as I sometimes do, I go mirrors, you know, you look at a painting, an artist will look at a drawing or a painting in the mirror, to see if it works or it doesn't work. I've got reducing lenses. You know, Bernini, the Italian Baroque sculptures, sculptor said, you know, you need to see your work as if it's someone else's. So with mirrors and reducing lenses to not magnify, but make it smaller. All these ways to look at it differently. And I even use the technology. So what I did is I put it into Photoshop. But I put both sculptures, the miniature wax, and I put the, the big one against a sheet that I backlit to get it in silhouette. Because the mini one was still better than the big one. And I needed to figure out why. So just as I need to know proportion and make all those measurements and write that stuff down and incorporate all these observations from the field and all this stuff, I also needed to really figure out why is this one better than this one? And the answer was about 38 <laughs> or 40 different things. Some of them, and the majority of them were millimeter level changes. The base the sculpture of the mini, after I put it in Photoshop, figured out it was 2.75 degrees higher. The front legs were 2.7 degrees higher. It was like doing this. But it made it better. So I cut the whole sculpture off the base. I cut out, I did the math, cut out a piece of wood on the table saw that was 2.7 degrees, stuck it under the armature, drilled it all back down to the base, put clay back all over it, and then went about figuring out all the other ones that were slightly off. So at times I will do five, eight, 10 versions of the exact same sculpture, sometimes in the exact same size, that you'd be like, why are you just doing it over and over? Each one of those has another tiny sliver that tells the story better. So that's where the difficulty to me is. It's no big deal and no trouble to make a wolf. What's difficult is making courage, motherhood, vigilance. So that's a long-winded answer, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Any other questions?
Yes. George, was your uh, inspiration for learning more about animal language your experience turkey calling? <laughs> <laughs> You've got inside info. That's not fair. So, to be fair, I grew up in the hook and bullet crowd. I was a hunter, fisher, and then a trapper, and a lot of the knowledge I have, to be honest, comes from dissecting and skinning and butchering and pursuing these animals to catch them and kill them. I don't hunt anymore because I came to value the education that came with them more than the desire to have them, if that makes sense. And so I learned this as, as an archery hunter. You, you can't shoot as far, so you have to watch more. But over time, I just didn't want to kill them because I learned so much by continuing to watch. So part of my upbringing was I just gravitated to things I could call. Why? Because there's just something about having a conversation, not just with another person, but across the species divide. <laughs> still fuels me to this day is it gives me insight into what's going on beyond my own senses. So when I hear a wolf howl this way, has drastically different meaning than when a wolf howls like this. Not a myth, 
it's aware. And routinely around our house, especially in winter, we'll hear that when we're walking the dog and all the way across the Yellowstone Valley, two miles away, I know there's wolves over there. And it's only just a matter of time to get the spotting scope out when we get back to the house, look, scan, oh, yeah, yeah, there, there they are. I even think there's a version that they do when there's a cougar around versus a wolf. Do you know this one? Have you ever heard this, Rachel? There's a very mouthy, and I've documented it a couple times, and I've been asking some of my cougar research friends if this is the case. A mouthier alarm bark. <laughs> Hear that difference? Yes. Listen for it. You're in good country to hear both of those. So, again, long to answer, but professional. One more. Yeah. What's my. Sorry. What's your favorite animal to sculpt? What's my favorite animal to sculpt? It's the one I'm excited to sculpt right now and then. <laughs> I love them all, and if I had to pick a favorite of all animals just out of the blue, it would probably be an insect. Because they have like these superhuman powers. <laughs> Compared to, you know, they just jump over the entire state building if they were our size. But I like sculpting, let me put it this way. I'll go sculpt in the park when I've got a sculpture close to done sometimes, or started, and I'll go look for that animal. And that's the surest way you can bet you're not going to see it. <laughs> so after a while of frustrating the heck out of yourself, you think, well, that's not my favorite animal anymore. <laughs> you take what comes, and because you're open to it and just see what you find, you may find a moose and a cat, and all of a sudden the whole world focuses in on that, and that becomes the most beautiful, amazing thing you've ever seen. And that, for that day, is the most amazing sculpture.